Okay, so now we have a nice dark place where we want to take a nap or read your email. <laughs> uh, we're going to get up here and talk a little bit about uh, poisonous people. My name is Brian Fitzpatrick. Uh, Fitz. My name is Ben Colin Sussman. You can call me Ben Colin Sussman. Um, and <laughs> we've been speaking together for quite a while, uh, working in open source for at least 10 years or so. And um, yeah, I, I like the, the title of our talk. Poisonous People was suggested to us by, by another conference, I think, because it, it was, we, was more scandalous sounding. Well, we had a bad word to start with. Anyway. Well, it was going to be, you know, if, if we had named our talk How to Be Nice and Get Along with People, it probably, you know, wouldn't get as big a crowd. But uh, Poisonous People sounds, you know, everyone's worried. Am I the poisonous person? So, so we're, we're hoping you'll we're hoping <laughs> get something uh, good. This is, not a, this is not actually a, a primer on how to be a poisonous person. That's a different talk entirely. <laughs> Um, but we hope you guys enjoy our talk. H have you guys been enjoying the conference so far? Yeah. <coughs> yeah? Excuse me. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can anybody still hear me <laughs> after that? Uh, so we're going to get started here, but before we start, we want to say that these are our opinions. Um, if you hold different opinions, we're perfectly glad to hear that, and we invite you to get your own conference and your own talk. Um, <laughs> we want to remind you that there are many ways to run open source communities. Uh, this is our preferred way, A. And B, we think that this is the way that sends the most energy into actually writing software as opposed to yelling, screaming at each other and disagreeing most of but the time. But we're also not making this up. We have a lot of experience working with open source, I'm different open source projects. Up. Well, you might be making it up. Okay. But, but we've, we have seen a lot of open source projects come and go. So we're sort of trying to relate our experiences, particularly with the Subversion project, because that was sort of our, our biggest experience. Um, and but uh, Which is kind of neat, because uh, the Subversion project, we, we were founders and developers of the Subversion Project, worked on it for many years um, with a guy named Carl Fogel, a good friend of ours. Um, our result of this project was to turn around and make a talk about some of the things we learned in community management. Carl turned around and wrote this fantastic book uh, all about, which is basically the same content as our talk, just in a lot more detail. So if you like what you hear today, go check out this book. It's actually, you can buy it O'Reilly from O'Reilly in hard copy. It's also under, I believe it's a Creative Commons license. Yeah, on, it's on, free. It's free up on the web. It's free as in too. book. Free. <laughs> um, so yep. Carl's book and our experiences are both, again, based on uh, what we've done with Subversion as well as the Apache Software Foundation. So this isn't just stuff that we made up over a weekend. Uh, it's actually based on some experiences. And we're hoping to relate this through a series of sort of anecdotes. We're going to tell, tell some basic stories about uh, different examples of poisonous people we've encountered and how to deal with them. But there's a few parts... Uh, to this, basically. Uh, you come across a poisonous person, first you have to understand what you're dealing with, okay? How to, work, how to fight against it and how to protect yourself against it, how to identify poisonous people, and lastly, how to disinfect your community from a poisonous person. Uh, the four sections. The four sections. Let's jump into okay. section one, understanding the threat to your project. So, you know, open source software, or this doesn't even have to be open, it could be any, any software development. The thing that is the most important to your project is the intention and focus of your community. What we mean by that is, you know, if people are busy arguing or fighting, um, you're not going to get anything done. And so there's a continuous tension trying to find a balance between getting consensus and having discussion, right, and at the same time making progress as well. Well, if you had a, if you had some sort of group of people and you had a pile of money in the middle of the room that you keep contributing to and someone came in the room and started taking money out of that pile, I think you'd be a little bit annoyed. Uh, in fact, you might call the police or provide <laughs> bodily harm to them. Um, attention and focus it, are the assets of an uh, open source project. They are the, the, the sort of common currency of an open source project, if you will. And when I, when I talk about poisonous people, in this case we're talking about um, a, people within your community, but B, people who may come from without your community and who want to distract you. But what, what, what do these people do? Okay. All right. Well, they can... Uh, we should show all these bullets. I like them. Show all the bullets at once? I do like there them. There you go. So, all right. So they, was, there's just forms of draining attention, right? Distracting you, draining you, causing infighting. They're all things that you've seen happen before. They, I was a victim of them. I'm here to tell my story. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ben. And, uh, and most importantly, you know, the thing that they can do... Sometimes they don't even realize that they're doing it. Um, for example, I mean, w it sounds like we're talking about trolls, but it's not always the case. For example, sometimes you have people who are part of your project, valued community members who are the nicest people in the world, but they happen to be um, perfectionist or obsessive compulsive. And what they end up doing is they, they sort of get bog you down in discussions about what should our process be and 
and how are we going to resolve this? And, and you, you, maybe you post a design question or design document, and you know, sure, you're going to have some discussion. Normally, you should have some discussion. But there's these people, uh, these perfectionists, they'll, they'll actually just engage you forever uh, to the point where you realize this is never going to terminate, right? right? And at, at that point, you have to sort of um, disengage yourself right? Right. And, and move forward. And What's so the, the example of this is uh, one of the subversion developers who's a, a really good guy, contributed a lot of great design discussion. But we, we started to get frustrated after a bit because we are just like, God, he just, we're, we're ready to get coding. He just wants to keep talking about this. He just wants to keep going. And we finally realized that he would never actually stop talking about the design for this product, project or this particular feature. And we, just, we were trying to think about ways to do it. We decided, let's just try saying, okay, we're done. We're going to move on and write code. We did that, and he, he was okay he was with fine. it. He, he, he went on, but he would if he, we hadn't done that, he would have just uh, kept on going for, for the rest of the Well, life. I mean, a typical way to end that conversation is to say, look, we're going to try this and then see where we are, and we can yeah. really see and reevaluate from that point, right? It's a nice way of stalling. Failure is an option, right? Failure is an option. Don't Good thing afraid. we don't work at NASA, right? So uh, fortifying against the threat. So well, how can you protect yourself from poisonous people or your community more, or your project? Uh, the first thing to do is, is build a strong community. And we recommend building a community based on four things that we're going to talk about a lot. Virtues, the four virtues. The four cardinal virtues. Uh, <laughs> politeness, respect, trust, and humility. And those don't really form a nice, like, uh, acronyms. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so we're going to try and get something in there with an A, but, you know, we had a little trouble with that. But uh, So if you build your community based on these things, you actually are going to be much more likely to be able to successfully repel people who come and try and, and prevent you from doing this, as well as, a, as attract these pe um, people who are similar to that. But one of the well, things that... People who, who are, if everyone in your community is following these virtues, somebody who comes in isn't, they stick out like a sore thumb. Although it doesn't seem to work the other way, right? If, if, you come, if a really nice person comes to a, an angry, screaming community, they tend to just get ignored. They tend to out. leave quickly. <laughs> or they don't come <laughs> in in the first place. Right. So there's a couple of best practices, even though we're not big fans of the whole best practices thing. I don't know what else to call it. Uh, <laughs> the first thing is to, is to have a mission. And this is another thing that scares people. Corporate doublespeak mission statement. Everybody run away quick. Uh, but the f there's two parts to this, okay? Pick a direction and limit your scope. This seems really obvious. I'm sure everyone's saying, duh, of course. But it, it, it's amazing how many people don't do this. They say, well, we're going to write this piece of software. Well, yeah, I, I was saying this in, a, in another talk we gave earlier today, that there's a lot of projects. If you go up to SourceForge or Google Code, you'll see a lot of projects where there's just Somebody says, hey, I'm going to, the project's basically one person, and there's like a design doc that's very vague. It says, we're going to write the best video game ever. And there's, there's, it's so vague. It's just like, you know, it's like a list of sort of general features or things the person thinks is cool. And nothing ever happens, right? Because either, either nobody cares and nobody pays any attention, nobody comes by. Or if people do come by to participate in the discussion, uh, there's no scope limiting for the discussion. So everybody just starts having these blue sky conversations about, what they'd like to see it be, and you never get to Or you play, the, you play the bring me a rock game, where the person would <laughs> say, I want to write a, a Space Invaders uh, knockoff. And the person's like, no, oh, that wasn't really what I was thinking of. And they're like, okay, we'll do Duke Nukem. And the guy's like, no, I wasn't thinking of that either. Guess, and guess you know, it's want. just keep guessing what I want type of a thing. And uh, it, so it's basically communicate this, save yourself a lot of time and energy. Well, so, Subversion's a great example. The very first thing we did when we put up a website for Subversion was we said, Here's our mission, and it's a very narrow scope. We want to replace CVS, because that's what everybody in the world was using, or at least all the open source communities with this, is that we, it gives us a metric for success, for success right? It also, instantly, if people aren't interested in replacing CVS, they don't come knocking on our door. Or if they do, we point to the website, and we say, hey, look, this is our mission. Sorry, I know you want to write something slightly different, but we're, that's not what we're doing, so you'll have to go start another project. Right, we weren't out to break yeah. profound new ground right. in version control. We weren't out to write a make integrated thing or but, ant but it, tasks. It or saved us endless discussion, right. just being able to, to that one end line. conversation. And if it's on the website, it's official. And people won't argue. No, no you, 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 think is, you think that's a, that's not actually not a joke. We have it's a lot of jokes in here, but that's right? a serious thing. If you say something in the mailing list, people will debate it for weeks. If you put it on a web page that took you three seconds to write and click submit on a wiki, suddenly they're like, oh, hey. It's official. It's official. <laughs> uh, try it. See what happens. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Uh, the next example is the Google Web Toolkit, uh, which is uh, – I'm a huge fan of the, the, the GWT team, and they're a really great bunch of guys. But when they started – when they decided to go open source, we, we talked a lot about how they do it. And I said, you know, this seems silly, but I need you guys to come up with a, a mission statement so that you can let people know 
what you're doing and what you're not doing. Stay focused. And they spent, we spent a lot of time coming up with this, this statement. And I want you to take a second and read it. I'm not, I know you can read it. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, but they, they wanted to, to narrow it for start to, to Java because they didn't want to spend time running a Python, a JavaScript interpreter, or a Haskell, a JavaScript, or arguing with people about it. And, and to concentrate on the users here. It's to enable developers, but it's no compromise. And they have a page called Making Wit Better. And if you're working on a, any kind of a project, I can't recommend highly enough to just go read this page and see what they say. They've got this statement, and they've got a very detailed explanation of why they chose each part of it. And I, I think it's a great way of letting people know, hey, these are the people we're looking for. Uh, th these are what we're looking to do here. This is what we're looking to do. And this is most specifically what we're looking not to do. So they just they, they, they save a, a, the, the problems yeah. of attracting people who aren't interested in it, jumping on your a bus. A really good strategy is when you, when you put a mission or statement up with, you know, here are our goals, to list non-goals. Um, it's also a very corporate thing to do, but it really helps keep things focused. Well, in our project at Google, which is uh, code.google.com, uh, the, ho the hosting component. So if you go to our project, which is slash p slash support, uh, you'll see there's a um, sort of making uh, Google code hosting better, making hosting better. And we sort of riffed off of this document, the mission statement, as well as some information. And that's sort of a way of letting people know what we, don't, we do and don't intend to do with the project. But, but enough about that. Let's Here's some more tips, general tips about starting out. Uh, mailing list etiquette. We need uh, people to not waste each other's time. Make sure your public discussions are, that, that are happening in public, that they're happening on mailing lists, that the archives of the mailing lists are visible to everybody so that when somebody comes along and opens up an old discussion, uh, they can, you can simply say, look, we talked about this six months ago. Here's why we're doing what we're doing. And you don't have to have the whole debate again. Otherwise, they're just wasting your time. And so you can tell them to go read it. Right. Um, and then this is, this is a thing that not everybody has come to this conclusion yet. I, but it, it, it's, I think it's a really important little tidbit, and that is uh, what we call um, the, the noisy minority effect. And what we mean by that is sometimes you'll, you're trying to come to a consensus on a mailing list, and if you stand back as sort of an observer, it looks like you see these back and forth emails, oh, we should do it, no, we shouldn't, yes, we should, no, we shouldn't. It looks like this really even-handed debate. And then you look a little closer and you realize, well, wait a second, there's like 20 people saying we should do it and one person saying we shouldn't do it. And that one person is basically replying to every single mail response, right? And it creates this, this psychological effect that there really is a big opposition when there isn't. So uh, that's a pattern to look out for. Uh, and if you see somebody doing it, you just very politely say, you know what, please read the entire thread, you know, maybe every once a day instead of every five minutes. And, um, and then write one response that, that addresses the 20 messages that have shown up since the last time you looked. And, and it really gives a, a focused focused debate, and it keeps a, a noisy minority from influencing things in a strange way. Well, it's a way to help people realize that, you know, there isn't actually that much discord here. We may be, you know, inches away from consensus, but the, the one person is actually not consensed, but incensed. They're making a heck of a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, to moving on to more documentation, uh, document your project's history. Again, more obvious stuff here. There's a lot of different things here, but the most important one that I want to point out here is the mistakes, Okay. Sometimes someone will come up to your project and be like, hey, we should do this. And if you say, you know, we tried that a year ago, blah, 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 it didn't work out. Their response is going to be, well, you didn't try it my way, you know? <laughs> it's the Floby. Uh, but with, if you document these mistakes in your mailing list or whatever, or in a design doc, we tried this, this is why we're not going this route, that shows people that you've actually thought about it. And they can sort of see some of the things you've tried and think, and they won't try to do those again. But it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice measurable way of learning from your failures, right? And it's goes with our whole philosophy of not being afraid of failure, or at least lots of small failures, and then documenting those failures. Right. It's, it's, it's very useful. And uh, c code changes uh, have, is a great, a great way of documenting things. Why do we do this? Uh, having commit log messages that are consistent and somewhat informative. Saying fixed bug is never really a good commit message, because <laughs> then someone has to go and look at the code to figure it out. You could say fixed off by one error, or fixed uh, you know, security fix, or whatever not, yep. that type of thing. And I think in the Subversion Project, we've got actually, <laughs> I love this. Um, the Subversion Project, we've actually, uh, we've got a policy about log messages, right? Where we actually format our commit messages in a very specific way that makes it easy to search through them. So that's something you might want to consider as well. What we need is a good search engine. How would you do that? Anyway. Uh, he healthy code collaboration policies. Now, one of the things that, now Carl observed this uh, with, with regard to code review. Oh, right? yeah. And one of the things we do at Google uh, internally is, is a process of review. We require that every piece of code written is reviewed before it's submitted. 
Now, open source projects usually will submit something and do review after the fact. I cannot stress how important this is. Now, Carl is, uh, has been involved in Emacs before, and he Emacs uses a they, they, they still use CVS, if you can believe it. People use C Anyone here still use CVS? Okay, oh, see me okay. afterwards. Whoa. The one person. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, they still use CVS, but they have this log message script that sends out a log message in one email. In the separate email, it sends out the actual diff of the changes that have, have been it's made. It's kind of hard to figure out that they go together. It's kind of hard <laughs> to figure out that they go together, but it makes it a lot harder to sort of uh, have a comprehension. And it makes it, it makes that little bitty tiny step up makes it harder for people to do code review. And as he went through and he found, I think, one thread over the past five years where That's people had actually thing. reviewed a line of code. That, Whereas that then he went to the Subversion Project and he saw something like 20% of all mail threads were code review or related to code review, which, yeah. is, which is great. And that, that's n it's a matter of having the right tools in place, right? Make sure you have commit emails being sent to your list because that sort of forces people to review code because it's effortless, right? You're just reading your inbox. Oh, what did so-and-so do yesterday? Oh, cool. Oh, he wrote a bug. Let me tell him right now, right? It's zero effort on your part to do review. The other thing is, I mean, it's also it's a cultural thing, too. If you start code review in your community from the beginning, that culture will pervade. And right. I, I think that's also probably one of the problems Emacs is having. Is it's just, there's no history of it. Right. And if you're, do, and if you're going to be collaborating, we encourage people to do, uh, do big changes on branches. Or at the very least, do them in, in, in a public way that other people can see and review them as you're going along. We talk a lot about, uh, we, we don't allow what we call power plants in Subversion. Anyone here heard, heard of the bike shed uh, theory? Okay, the bike shed theory, it's, it's based on Parkinson's third or fourth law, which is that uh, the amount of time and effort inversely proportional to its complexity. And the example he uses, and I'll tell the story real quick, is uh, many years ago, a company was designing, building a new nuclear power plant. And the engineers came in with this gigantic pile of paper, and they set it down, and they said, this is our design for the power plant that we want to build. And, you know, everybody, <clears throat> you know, looked, yeah, certainly we need a nuclear power council, plant. Right? Yeah. yeah, you know, that's certainly, yes, looks good. You know, someone's certainly done all the diligence, so give it a big rubber stamp and send them on their way with a you know, $45 billion power plant or whatever it might be. Six months later, the guys they come in with a single sheet of paper and they say, you know, the power plant progress is going great. The workers who ride their bikes in, however, would like to build a little bike shed to put their bikes in. Um, and here's the plans for it, and we just wanted to sign up. It's going to be $700, whatever or not. It will spend days discussing what color to paint the bike shed because, A, it's easily comprehensible, and, B, it's a way of putting your thumbprint on it of showing, you know, I made an effect. I chose the color for that bike shed over there. And, uh, right. <laughs> and so the <laughs> inverse of that is the power plant. And uh, so we certainly push people to not show up with a huge pile of code one day because it's just about impossible to review something that big. Absolutely. It's, it's really it's unfair to the rest of the community. So if somebody <laughs> in your project is going to start doing something long and disruptive and maybe, you know, work for a few weeks on something that's going to disrupt everybody else, just make a branch. It's not a scary thing. If you use Subversion, in fact, um, I believe next week or so we're going to release uh, uh, built-in merge tracking into Subversion. So branching and merging has become a whole lot easier than it, than it has been. And yeah. Yay. <laughs> After only a couple of years. I didn't write a line of code for that. That was awesome. Uh, and if you're using a distributed version control system, clone your repository and have a copy of it clone in the server if right. you're going to do that. But don't, just because you're using distributed version control, don't use that as an excuse to work in a cave for three months and then show up and say, here's my great new feature, right? Because no one's going to review that either, right? And if people are reviewing it, they review. They wind up reviewing it for readability. They wind up reviewing it for white space and semicolons right. and curly braces. Let people see what you're doing. There's you no go. design going to take place. You're going to say, well, you right. made a fundamental flaw in your design. And you're like, Last well, <laughs> it's written. There it is. Uh, so anyway, be generous with branches uh, for people. And uh, you want to talk about the bus yeah, factor? You know, what, we, what we call bus factor is basically how many people have to be hit by a bus on your team before you're, you're, you're doomed? Uh, so, you know, I mean, some people call it job security, but we call it really bad for a community. Um, and I mean by it's that not is just a bus, right? I mean, it could be a bus. Well, the thing is, right, you know, when we say hit by a bus, that's an exaggeration, right? People leave projects. People get married, they have kids, they move away, they just run out of time, or, or maybe they really do get hit by a bus. But the point is, you shouldn't have, uh, you know, all knowledge of one part of your software in one person. Right. Let people collaborate and share the information. And that, that means, essentially, you also have to discourage people from feeling like, well, this is my module. I wrote this. You must you know, get every change approved by me. That, that leads to 
a tiny, tiny bus factor. Very dangerous for the long-term health of your community. And we, we strongly discourage people from using what author tags or putting names in the source code. Uh, Actually, I think that's coming up. Is right? it coming up? Oh, maybe. Right, well, well, maybe it is. Well, I'm going to say it right now. Yeah. So there, uh, don't put your name in source code, please. Because uh, if you do, what, open source, what is the barrier to put your name in a, a file? You wrote four lines, you wrote a function, you wrote a class, 10 lines, 12 lines. What if you deleted somebody else's contribution? Do you take their name out of the file? You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a whole big time sink is what it is. Uh, we encourage people to... Uh, well, if you really want to know who's responsible for writing what code, you've got the version control system to tell you, right? You don't need an announcement at the top of the file. And typically people have a file that says somewhere, a web page that says who works on the project. And mm -hmm. you, know, you list patch contributors, et cetera. Yep. So, oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Woohoo. All right. Oh, we have an example too. The the example of this story, we had the guy show up on Subversion, um, and Subversion initially used CVS's date parser, which is just a total mess. And but we thought it was okay to use it for now, and eventually we'd rewrite it. But it allows really cool things like next week to be parsed. Yeah, next week sorta or whatever, or three days after next <laughs> Tuesday. But uh, we had a guy come up and said, you know, I'd like to go ahead and take on this task of rewriting this. It's a nice encapsulated bit. He did that. He wrote this whole file, and it was, and he submitted the patch. And the very first thing we said to is, you know, remove your name from the top as per our hacking guidelines. Because our, our, our code collaboration guidelines are all in this beautiful document. It's a document on a web page, so, so it's, it's official. official. Right, exactly. <laughs> so he's, he wrote back. He's like, no, I wrote this file. Why should I not put my name? I wrote the whole thing. It's like, fine. It's, yeah, we're like, well, that's great. We understand that and appreciate that, but... This is a decision we've made as a community, and we, not, we don't allow that. And I, I think the temptation here for a lot of people is to say, wow, there's this code, this guy's writing things. We, we really, really want this, this, or we need this. Yeah, we want it, we need it. And so people will sacrifice the, the, the core like values of their team for this new person who's come in, and 99% of the time it's not worth it. Well, it's just, yeah, so, don't, don't sacrifice the long-term health of your community for a short-term gain. So we said, look, we're really sorry, but we're not going to accept this patch as is. And he says, fine, I'm taking my code and I'm leaving. And he did. And he went away. We never submitted his patch. Six weeks later, some other guy came along and said, hey, I can write a date parser <laughs> for you it. guys. <laughs> and he did it. And we had it. Right. So, you know, it was a short-term inconvenience, mildly. Uh, but in the long term, we still wind up yeah. where we are. Well-defined processes. All right, bad meeting. Well, no, I'm kidding. If you guys are all software developers. So the same processes that you would use within a corporation, the same ones you should use for an open source project, right? You should have release branches. You should, um, you know, backport, no, it's not backpack bugs, backport bug fixes. Thank you. I backported that bug <laughs> into the slide deck, actually. Oh, no. That's been in um, every version of this talk right, we've given, I think. No, you know, have, have a release manager. Have a release process documented for your, for your software, right? It, just like a corporation would. Um, because it, it resolves conflicts, it saves time, nobody has to argue or wonder about what do we do this time. Um, and when it comes to reviewing patches, you should have a policy in place, uh, in place as well. Uh, in other words, um, one of the common problems we've seen actually is that if a project's really busy, um, people will post patches to the mailing list and they'll kind of fall through the cracks because nobody has time or everybody's working on different things. Um, and that's bad because then you never get new contributors and then people start to feel like they're being locked out. Um, so or ignored. One, or ignored. So one of the, one strategy you can do is you know appoint somebody in your community to be a patch manager, sort of like a release manager. Patch manager watches to see what patches are coming in. If if a, if a patch comes into the mailing list and nobody's replied to it for a few days, they'll file it as a ticket, right, or as a as a bug or something, and then reply and say sorry, we'll get to this soon. So that at least that way it's not falling through the cracks. Um, and then lastly, have a policy, have a procedure for growing your your community, right? It can't be completely ad hoc. Um, one thing that we've noticed that's really important is that um, it, your culture becomes self-sustaining. And what we mean by that is if, if, you know, every project starts out with maybe two people, and if they're really nice people and they, they have those four virtues of politeness and respect, then they tend to attract more people who are in that same vein. Um, and if you start out with a couple of people who are angry and screaming and chest-thumping, they attract more angry, screaming people. And uh, it, it, it perpetuates itself. So... Think about your culture. Think about what kind of a community you want to build, but at the same time, have a procedure for building a new community. A really common thing that a lot of projects do is they'll have a separate mailing list just for um, the, the people with sort of like commit access right. or you know, the leaders of the community, and they'll actually say, hey, I think so-and-so will nominate somebody. So-and-so has been contributing some great patches. Let's give them full commit access. And but that mailing list well, is only for discussing 
new committers that's and that sort happens, of thing. That's right. No technical discussions take place in the mailing list. Technical discussions take place in the open. It's only there so that people's feelings don't get hurt. And they say, you know, I think this person's ready to become a full uh, committer to the project, or they're not ready yet, or, or whatever the case may be. But um, it's, it's important to have that process. And our general rule for accept accepting someone new into our community is that, first of all, they do no harm. You know, we look for people who are, are smart and who are good developers, who know how to write clean patches, that sort of thing. But if there's somebody who still writes some good code but lives a little wild and might do some annoying stuff, you don't want people to come in. It's, it's a lot harder to revoke commit access. And we actually did that early on in the Subversion project. We gave commit access to some guy who was like a, a machine language programmer that survived the meteor strike somehow. Well, he kept writing. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he kept he kept like super over optimizing, you know, things. He like he would. Have an array of structures well, that he would alphabetize into a binary search through 20 items it, to, to we, save we a kept, few cycles. We kept giving him reviews, and he wouldn't apply the, the re he wouldn't take any of the feedback or do anything. So he basically wasn't playing with other people. So we were like, well, sorry. But that took a lot of energy out of the community. Oh, it was, to do it was that. horrible. I hope we never mm -hmm. do that again. Yeah. The last thing is, um, uh, oh, actually, you should tell the story. Should I tell my story? Uh, so a founder can be booted. Uh, there's a project that I, I have some friends who worked on. And there's a guy that founded this project, and he worked on it, and he built a community around it. And it was a, it's a very widely used open source project. And he went off and did his own thing for two years. And you know, meanwhile, they grew. They added more people. They added more features. They expanded the project. And he shows up two years later, and it's like, hey, you know, I've been thinking I want to completely redesign and change the direction. This is how we're going to do it. And you know, this is what it's going to be now. And people were like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? <laughs> this is a consensus-based software project. They were like, who is this guy? They're like, oh my god. What, what are we going to do? He's hijacked our project. He's stealing our project. And I'm like, what do you mean he's stealing your project? You operate on consensus, right? There's eight of you and there's one of him. Get him. And, uh, <laughs> and they, they were like, but we can't. He's, he's the founder. And I'm like, does he have some sort of like, you know, godlike capabilities that I'm not aware of? You know? <laughs> well, you know, he had part of the project. And I, I, what I told them is that, you know, he's gone off and he's coming back and he's not going to play by the consensus rule, the rules that you guys have set in. He's not uh, being an active community member and playing, uh, basically playing ball. This, well, this gets into a larger discussion of, you know, how is your community set up? There are some community, we think consensus-driven communities are the most effective and most sustainable over the long term. There are open source communities that, you know, do have sort of an enlightened despot running things, right? And, and that's okay, but it can also, right, why isn't despotism used in the real world, right? Because it, it's not sustainable, right? It isn't? It's, it's, Oh, it's great if you've got an enlightened despot, <laughs> and it's not sustainable in the long term. It's the same thing with open source projects. We, if you can move away from an enlightened despot model, we encourage you to do that. Right. Right. So, so that sort of leads us to the next thing, talking about consensus. And this is sort of a, a thing that a lot of I, I, I see a lot of people new to open source. Apache has an incubator. A lot of companies uh, sponsor software at Apache, and it goes into the incubator, including Google. Our, our shit, we're working with Shindig right now, which is really great. I'm a mentor for that project. And a lot of people first come to open source, they read all this information, they read about voting, and they're like, oh, this voting thing Plus is one, great. Minus one. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know? And they'll start having a discussion on the mailing list, and someone will do some disagreement, and like three mails in, somebody will go, let's call a vote. Plus one, minus one. It's exactly, like, and zero. so people will start voting on something, and I'm like, whoa, 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 you know? You haven't actually finished discussing what's going on. You haven't come to a point where actually you could probably discuss a little further and come to a solution that's even better than what one side or the other is talking oh, come about. On. No, come on. Crazy. Uh, um, but that is that is a telltale sign. If you see a, a community that's voting all the time, something is very wrong. Well, with a vote, you have winners and losers, right? Um, <laughs> as opposed to compromise. As opposed to, to well, I, I hate to use the word compromise because people sometimes think that right. you're, you're, you know, you're coming to something that's less than, than what you initially worked with. But it's a, it's a way of, of working through and coming to a solution that's better than, than what you initially come up with. I think the Subversion Project in its eight-year history has only had one vote ever called. And it was, it was so serious. Important. Uh, we no, were seriously. trying to decide whether to uh, put spaces before parentheses or not in our code format. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was a huge issue, and people started, you know, lobbying each other and, you know, calling up old committers on the phone. And you saying, did you that. Gotta, you got to come vote in this thing. I know you haven't written code for three years, but you got to come vote. And, yeah, I did that. You called up Jim Blandy yeah. and came in, and he voted right. against you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we lost. But, I mean, that was, that was just ludicrous. Most of the time we could actually, you know, work our way through these type of things. Uh, but so maintain your standards. This is a quote from a friend of ours, another developer, which I'll let you read. 
And, and this is actually something I completely agree with that has changed in the past. In the past, people would have some super genius show up in their community, and you'd have a group of four or five normal people going about their work, and then some super genius would come in, and the rules didn't apply to this person because they were super smart, and they wrote a lot of code, and <laughs> we should just let them do whatever they want. And they would basically poison the community because you know, even if they are super smart, then that doesn't mean that they should have anything any special privileges or anything, but you know, there's so many super smart engineers out there that are working in open source and otherwise that it's just it just doesn't make sense well, to, to do this for well, playing well people. with others is just as important as writing great code. And so this this goes back into our theme of you know don't sacrifice the long term health of your community for a short term gain because some some genius is here in front of you about to give you some great code. It's not worth it. All right. So let's move on to the identification part. Wow, we're 40 minutes in. Let's go. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, how do you identify somebody uh, as being poisonous? The bozo, Fitz, Fitz calls it the bozo bit. If he sees some emails go by and he realizes this person is going to be a big time suck, he'll, be, he'll say to me, he'll say, uh, well, I flipped the bozo bit. I'm not going to reply to this person. And Ben's meanwhile <laughs> writing his seventh email to the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? no, right. But, but, what, but, what but it's a good means. So the signs. <laughs> Communication annoyance. They may use silly nicknames. They may use different nicknames in different media. Uh, they may use, their IRC nickname may be Sir Hacksalot, and then their email is Sir Woody Hackswell, and then they sign their name Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I talking to here? And then the issue tracker is something different, so it's hard right. to know. They, they may yell online. Uh, they may be attached to the exclamation key um, or other things. I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't speak MySpace here. <laughs> um, they may exhibit a, a general sense of cluelessness, and this isn't actually uh, unable to pick up in the mood is, is an engage in ish, engagement issue. It may be harder for some people to sort of engage with the l way that you guys are doing. They, they may not understand what your goals are. They may ask a whole bunch of questions instead of reading yeah. up on some of these it's, things. It's kind of it's more like it's just like a social, uh, socially stunted, right? They just don't know how to talk. To it's not even that they're hostile. It's just they they are just unable to pick up on, on social cues from other people. Right, you're three weeks away from release, and they're like, hey, let's write new features. And you're like, um... Are you paying attention? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're over here, and we're over there. But you, d you do get hostile people sometimes, right? They'll come in and they'll say, your software is terrible, and I don't want to use it, and, um, and I, I think it sucks, but, oh, by the way, can you help me over here? Um, yeah, well, then there's a the person who comes in and <laughs> demands help, right? <laughs> and and you've, you've, you've got to help me. You know, I've paid nothing for this software, but you've got to help me. Or, or the best is, uh, I like your software, but it's missing this feature, and you know what? I've got 10 developers who are ready to help you write this feature, but you have to agree to this feature. And we're like, well, that's not really how we work. You know, it's just, right. I mean, you don't have that kind of leverage over our group. Right, some people just show up, and they just have nothing to do but troll. Troll, yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we all know the trolls. Oh. Yeah, this is my favorite. The cabal. There's yeah, no cabal. There's, there's a <laughs> right. Well, this, this is just, this is just regular social dynamics, right? They see a happy, functioning community. They're not in the center of it. Um, if, if, if an idea they propose gets even politely and respectfully rejected, suddenly it's... It's an it, old it's, boys it's, network. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. Blah, blah. I mean, yeah. it's just, there's nothing you can do about that, right? Except, except maintain your own integrity. Right. Keep your side of the street clean, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so you get conceited people who refuse to acknowledge other opinions because, you know, they know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're experienced. They have N years of experience in the field. They're better. They have 15 degrees, and they're better than you. And also. Better than you. Uh, the other ones are the sweeping claims. This is a, a good one. Uh, well, just, just, just looking at the crystal ball, somehow they've decided that they're, they know the future and that they know exactly how things are going to play out. I, if you I don't do this, it's going to be a complete failure, yeah. and no one's going <laughs> to use your product. And then finally, there's just the, uh, the issue of not respecting other people's time, right? Forcing people to have conversations over and over again when they could simply reread archives. I mean, a lot of them will refuse to do that, right? You'll say, please go read our archive. We resolved this a long time ago. And if they don't go back and reread the archive, then that's just a sign of disrespect to the entire community and a real, real telltale sign. Uh, right. So let's move on to non-cooperation. Some people will show up and complain, and but not help fix. And this isn't to, this isn't talking about people who are incapable of fixing something. Non-programmers, non-engineers. Some people will show up and they're engineers, and they're just going to complain about things. And you, and then what, what usually comes up next is the open source way of saying "go screw yourself," which is "patch is welcome." Uh, <laughs> that's sort of your, your way of saying, you know, shag off. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you'll get people who don't want to discuss design. Or it, this is very common, actually. Uh, people who just can't take criticism of any uh, flavor, constructive that, or otherwise. That, that's actually something that's sort of unique to open source development is that you know people need to be, people are giving each other constructive criticism all the time, 
and you you sort of learn to have a thick skin if you participate in this way and it's actually ah very foreign to people who've never done open source you know or maybe coming out of a corporate environment it's a you know well what's what's that great story you have about yeah a friend of mine who went to work in a small company about twenty developers and he noticed they didn't have commit messages set up so he set commit messages up and the first thing he did was he sent a code review to somebody and he sent another code review and one of the other his manager called him in his office and said you know I'm getting a lot of feedback from people that you're really being negative, you know? <laughs> you're getting a lot of, like, criticism from them. He's like, so this code review thing, I don't think it's going to work out. He's like, yeah, I don't think this whole job thing is going to work <laughs> out. Well, um, no, but it's, the, the, the takeaway is that you are not your code, right? It, just don't don't worry about it. It's not it's not about you. It's about the code and how to make the code better. But it's a way of, it's a way of learning, and too. It's a learning I mean, experience, yeah. right? If, if you don't ever get feedback on your code, you never get better. So... Yeah. It's great. So let's move on and find out how to get rid of the poisonous people or how to how to get rid of the poisonous behaviors. We'll talk more about that. What do you do to assess the damage? There's really two important questions, right? Something's going on, something set off your spidey sense. Two questions to ask. First of all, is attention and focus being drained away? Um, and most likely yes, otherwise you wouldn't be worried in the first point. Right? Maybe there's some heated debate going on, maybe there's a troll, maybe there's somebody being a perfectionist. Who knows what it is? But the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, is this all right, maybe attention and focus is being drained, but is it likely to resolve? Is it likely to resolve anytime soon? And is the result, is the final resolution, going to be worth all this energy that's being spent? And that's, that's really hard. Um, it's a hard question to answer. And sometimes maybe you'll have to have a conversation with some other people in the project and right. say, look, we're spending a lot of energy here. I mean, is this really worth it, or should we just cut it short and keep going? Um, and that's, that's a call you have to make, and there's sort of an art to doing that. But I think it's, it's something, a question you need to revisit and not be afraid of visiting because you... Oh, we might hurt somebody's feelings, or you know, that's just you have to look at the health overall of the community. Right. There's a lot of gray area involved here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no black and white type of way. So, but there are a few things we recommend not do's to and do. Do's and don't. Don't uh, feed the energy creature. Okay. The, we we highly recommend ig ignoring people that show up and try to troll you. Uh, if you give people a you know an ability some, something to grab onto, they're gonna you're gonna do that. One of my favorite things. I live in Chicago. We both live in Chicago. Anybody here from Chicago? You can yeah. say yeah. <laughs> like two people raising me. They're kind of quiet. <laughs> Um, they're afraid of the left coast, right? But uh, uh, I, I'm driving in Chicago occasionally. I may do something that's not quite polite on accident, right? And somebody will start yelling at me and screaming honking at me and honking their horn. And, you know, I could turn around and yell at them, but what I love to do is turn around and just wave at them. Huh? Like, hey! <laughs> and they just go nuts. I mean, it's just completely nonlinear. You just see their head just explode in the side of their car. But, you know, I don't give them that opportunity to just, like, you know, yell back at them because that gives them the chance to engage. Um, which is another thing you don't want to do. Well, the other thing is it's, it's really easy to get emotional when, when somebody comes by. I mean, what actually happened, this is the example I have here, was Subversion was, was getting pretty usable. I mean, it was getting to the point where people were starting, just beginning to use it in the early days. And uh, somebody came to our list and was like, hey, um, you know, you guys are, it's cool that you're trying to write a new version control system, but really I'm, I know how to do this better than you, and I've got this other version control system over here, and we're doing things better, and you should all basically stop what you're doing, and we should merge our projects together and follow my lead. And, and he started sort of like criticizing all of our design decisions. And, and of course, you know, being young and naive, I was started like typing furious emails defending all of our decisions and our history and blah, blah, blah. I've like flipped the bozo a bit, bang, right, bad right, cop. And I, Ben's I like, good like, cop, good cop. Well, good it's cop. like three days I lost just an emotional expenditure when, when, you know, in retrospect, I could have seen after a few emails that this wouldn't have gone anywhere, that we were clearly not going to do this ridiculous thing of you know, dropping everything and going in. Nobody wanted to do that. Nobody believed this guy. But I put all this emotional investment into it anyway uh, just because I was worried, well, one person doesn't like me. I better... You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a trap. Yeah, it, it is, it's a trap, and it's easy to get sucked into that. So let's talk about some things you can do. Um, we talked earlier about, paying, about handling patches, okay? A newcomer to your project, uh, especially a, a capable developer, the, their sort of knock on your door will often be in the form of a patch. Um, so it's, it's very important not to ignore patches, and it's very important to at least sort of let them know that you're watching them. And they may be a little bit annoying, of course. I talked about this sometimes difficulty sort of engaging, like transmission, sort of grinding a little bit. Uh, and this is where, like I said, I have very little patience for this sort of thing. I'm like, God, ignore them, go away, whatever. And Ben will be like, no, come on, let's, let's talk to them and sort Pick of... Pick up that cop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, so that's the, the first thing. Uh, the second thing is to look for the factor under the emotion. Uh, and and if, if possible, pull out a real bug report. We have a, there was a guy, I mean, I'm very proud of, of the, the subversion culture for doing this. 
there was ah a rather famous open source person came to our list and was sort of screaming and ranting saying your software is terrible. i can't believe you released i got this bug and and what were you thinking and you are all on crack and rah rah. it was just insane amount of bile and you know you know i was so happy somebody else one of our developers in the uk wrote back this like really calm email just saying okay well looks like you found a bug here and you know sort of just extracting raw data and and okay i think yeah i think that got patched last week and and you know the guy writes back again rah 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 you're terrible you guys are all idiots blah blah and then you know one more reply okay all right yep i verified it's all fixed it's going to be out in the next release thanks a lot like and the guy responded again well you're such a stupid idiot well he just made himself look silly right i mean he really he really he looked like a complete moron we got a bug fix you know? Fantastic. But I, you know, the first time I read this email, like my, I just my blood pressure went through the roof, and I'm like, kill! You know, hit the smite button, right? A little smite button on your keyboard. And uh, and Ben was Ben, Ben uh, was talking about this other guy who really yeah. just very logically uh, pulled out the info. Yeah, which stay great. cool, stay cool. Man. So there's some other stuff. Know when to give up and ignore, right? And I, I think that's sort well, of already, the, already the, the first thing you talked about there. You should have just sort of given yeah. up and ignored them much earlier. Um, Ooh, yeah. And. And this is the, the hardest, I'd say, the hardest moment we ever had in Subversion Community. We had a, a, a developer who showed up who's super enthusiastic, but somewhat clueless. Um, he would hang out in IRC, he'd hang out on the mailing list, and our mailing list turned into like sort of his stream of consciousness. Like, you know, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? Or hey, can we do this? Someone would ask a question. He's emailing every 15 minutes. Yeah, someone bizarre. would ask a question. Hey, can we do this with Subversion? And he'd be like, sure, you can do this. And he would give them the wrong answer. And then, and so I, it was just all this energy going in this, and I'm like, I just had this sense that, you know, this guy was really taking a lot of time, and I'm like, how can I, how can I show this to the other developers? Because I don't want to say, you know, this dude's wasting our time. And I'm a huge fan of data, graphs, pictures, all that stuff. And so I took my mail spool for the Subversion Developers List the last month, and I wrote a little program that analyzed it, and I found the top five people posting to the list, he was number two. Wow. And he actually wrote no code. And the other four were people who were actually full-time committers in Subversion, three of whom were paid to work on Subversion full-time. So I did a little further analysis, and I discovered that two-thirds of their answers were to him. <laughs> okay? And so I, I took this data, and I sent it off privately to, to Ben and a couple other guys and said, look, this is what we've got. This is a problem. I really think it's affecting our forward progress. It's a nice guy draining all of our focus and energy. And so we wound up sending it to the, to the Subversion committers, and we talked about it in our little private list because we didn't do it in public and hurt the guy's feelings. And what we actually find up, we did is one of our guys, Carl, who's like the nicest human on the planet, called this guy up and had a long talk with him and, and politely asked him to just cool off and not post our list for a while. And, and he didn't actually understand what the problem was, but he did that. And you know, suddenly yeah, productivity kicked back to normal. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a hard story. Um, I mean, one of the, of course, the troll thing, right? Uh, we, we all hang out in IRC. Um, one day we were all, you know, some guy came in and started screaming at us and saying, ah, subversion is terrible, it's awful, blah, 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 it's, it's not doing this for me. And, of course, you know, like like you would expect, you start saying, oh, well, did you install this package? Did you use this switch? Blah, blah, blah. And he's coming back with more bile, same kind of thing. And finally, this goes on for maybe 10 minutes, and finally at the, at the end of all this helpful feedback, he just sort of says, well, I came in here for an argument. You guys are being nice. This is ridiculous. And he goes away. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, like, he actually admitted it. This is amazing. This isn't an argument. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so sort of the final touch on this is that is, to, is one of some of the criticisms we've had about this talk in the past is that we're just like, you know, getting rid of people, throw people out, treat them like crap. But this isn't about throwing people out of the talk. It's about, it's about throwing behaviors out of your community. And one of our, one of our commu committers who actually an extremely prolific committer first showed up. He was very caustic. He had some really good points. But the way that he would say them was just offended a lot of people and was just sort of just like very like in your face. Right. So we didn't throw him out of the community. We didn't boot him. We just took him aside and said, can you please be nicer? Took him aside and no, I'm just no, kidding. No. Uh. <laughs> but we, we were just like, look, look, you know, you're really upsetting people. Can you change your tone a little bit, be a little more respectful? Yeah. And, and he did. He I mean, did. It, it he's it he's like, you know, I don't really work that way, but he did that, and he would catch himself, and it worked out really well. Mm -hmm. So uh, always, that, that's, that's, that's just our, our, our takeaway, is that if you see bad behavior, don't boot people. Address the behavior first, right? Booting people out is really the very, very last resort. And and one of the things that, that we would do is, is in addressing the behavior, is when someone would show up and do something, we would reply to the actual public list and, and reply to their point that they had in the mail, but also say, you know, look, we really don't 
talk that way around here. We try to teach people a little differently. So this is appropriate for our community. And try and concentrate on the behavior and not attack the person because they may very well be offended or be more upset. And again, you're not going to be able to handle everyone in this way. People are still going to be jerks or, or whatever not, and do what they want to do. You can't change uh, everybody or most yeah. people for that matter. My wife will agree with that. Um. <laughs> so here's, our, here's our, our final takeaway slide. Remember, you're trying to preserve attention and focus, right? That's ultimately what really matters, other than beyond the code itself. Make sure uh, your community stays healthy. And the healthier it is, the more fortified it's going to be against poisonous people. Um, make sure you, you recognize when bad behavior is happening in the first place. And then finally, you know, don't be afraid to call out bad behavior. Don't be afraid to make short-term sacrifices for long-term health. Right. That's, that's basically it. But there is, there is an important bit here, right? And that is um, all of this stuff that we've been talking about really even though we've been talking about open source, it's not really about open source. It's about pretty much any community. Like, it could be your church group. It could be your team at work. It could be your family. I mean, any, any kind of you have, if you have community development or any kind of community functioning in one direction, this, all these behaviors will show up. Anytime you get so, more than two people in a room, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's it. And that's it. That's our talk. Thank you. Thank you. We've got we've got plenty of time for Q and A here, so if people have any questions Step or up answers, to the mic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any answers are welcome. Steve. Hi, I've been on IRC with Theo Durat and uh, DJB and John Stevens, and we all think your talk sucks. Oh yeah, <laughs> John <laughs> Stevens. We love those guys. Speaking of experience over here. Yeah. Bit. <laughs> any questions? Oh, here comes here comes another question. One problem that I always ran into with, with running any kind of project was, well, not often, but the most dangerous thing was what I call the charismatic control freak, somebody who's very well liked by everybody, very, you know, has a leadership, but doesn't know, but has, you know, bad design decisions, bad, you know, can't code. So what, um, you know, I've always found that the difficult you know, a problem to solve, and I don't know how to solve it. I was hoping that you guys would talk about it. So, sorry, so the question is uh, we're talking about a, a person who's a charismatic <laughs> leader and sort of a control freak but actually has no technical qualifications to make decisions? Or right, right, or somebody that, you know, it's, it's somebody who it's loses a focus. I mean, it's all, about, it's all about them not getting the project done. You know, very often we'll, like, wreck a project. No, because this isn't gone wrong, right? Well, I mean, that's that, that depends on the on the group of people that are sort of you know sitting on the bus that this person's driving. If someone's driving a bus off of a cliff and you're on the bus, you have a choice. You can either jump off and cover a few bruises, or you can stay on the bus and ride off the cliff with them. And you know, or you if can grab really, the steering wheel. <laughs> or, you can, or you can you can try and grab the steering wheel. Um, although I don't recommend doing that on an airplane. Um, the but that's that's a hard problem. And what what usually happens in these cases. Is, and one of the reasons we advocate consensus-based development is that if you're operating in a consensus, that means that 50, more than 50% of, of your developers are basically in agreement on where you're going, where you're, where you're going to take this bus. All right. So if people decide they don't ag agree with you or like you or, or have a problem, they're going to splinter off. And they're going to go and um, you know basically fork. swarm. They're going to fork. They're going to go off and start a community somewhere else. It's really difficult to do that with the minority of the developers. Uh, but if you're running, if you're running with an enlightened or unenlightened despot, as you're talking about here, what will frequently happen is the people will eventually get tired because you can only carry so far in charisma, mm -hmm. and they'll go off and they'll move move elsewhere and restart the project. But I, I would also say the problem isn't just with the the despot, right? It's also with the rest of the community. Why do they tolerate or put up this person? Maybe maybe this person is really charismatic and wonderful, but um, I think it's a matter of you know trying to get the rest of the community to feel like they have some power beyond what this one person's opinion yeah. is. And that's, that's a social engineering problem, I guess. Uh, don't have any magic bullets there. Yeah. Other than that. Right. Yeah. Let, let's take the next question. Thank you. Yeah, you guys talk a, a bit about good cop, bad cop. Um, I'd, I'm curious if you'd expound a little bit on that and, and specifically talking about how to give folks feedback. Um, uh, sometimes, like the well-known founder of the community isn't always the right person to give feedback. I'm curious if you could talk about a couple of structures 
you know, where where the feedback works and, you know, where the how the hierarchy that kind of is there and then who does the feedback and how does it communicate? Just a couple of examples of how it works. The question yeah. is, is about the structure of a project and good good cop, bad cop, and how, yeah, how, to, uh, do how to do feedback. Well, to, to start with the good cop, bad cop part is that Ben and I don't act, play these roles. It's sort of like kind of how we are, who we are, I think, more than anything. I don't advocate uh, manipulate, try, attempting to manipulate people um, in that fashion. And actually, I, I don't advocate uh, playing bad cop. I know some people, uh, a, a friend of mine actually had to give a talk similar to this one, sort of, and his one of his sides was, Flame the flamers, flame me, or something. I don't know what it was. He, he advocated yelling at someone who yelled at somebody else, really loudly. And I was like, what? I, did, I didn't quite get that. It's and wrong. Don't make a right. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, it, is, it is sort of tricky, but um, I... I, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I agree. It's not about manipulation so much as it is. Um, it's about respect. Um, if somebody who is really well-respected doesn't know how to give constructive feedback, then... Maybe they should be taken aside and said, "Hey, maybe you should be a little kinder in your feedback." Or, or maybe somebody else in the community can be encouraged to step up and and be more vocal if they're particularly. It's a talent, right? Some people are good at, some people aren't. It's something that can be learned. Um, it's probably a whole book about that right there. Right. 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 Well, I, I asked I, I asked Adrian Hull about it. He does every block in Chicago crime and whatnot. I mean, I said, you got such a great visual style to your websites. How do you do that? Because he's admitted to me that he's just not much of a visual graphic design kind of guy. And he said, it's very easy. I know Wilson, and Wilson's really, really good at it. And I defer all design decisions to Wilson. But that's, that's okay. a humility issue. It's, right? it's a humility and a respect issue, right? He, know, he, knows, he knows that he's not good at that, so he sort of leaves that to someone else. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're not good at feedback, or if you know someone else isn't good at feedback, maybe giving them a little feedback that they're not good at feedback. Thanks. <laughs> Sort of. It's like a feedback loop. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I had a comment uh, just about something that's helped when you're dealing with a lot of customers who are doing the kind of flaming and troll, t and trying to control trolls. Uh, I find really helps is to, you talked about the very patient person, uh, to save emails like that so that you have their approach boiled down to a nutshell and then just have notepad or something set aside wherein, you know, here's how to deal with trolls. Troll number one, who, who, here's perfect answer. Pop it in the email and send it off to them. That way you've got your own scripts because you're the master of that situation. You're in it all the time. These people aren't reading your materials. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked those kinds of questions. So instead of a frequently asked question, it's a frequently answered answers so that you paste in. <laughs> sort of a template. It's, it's amazing. You've it's amazing because you can uh, answer them so politely and so pleasantly because it's the machine doing it. It's not really you, right? And so when you look at it, you're, like, you're foaming at the mouth and you're looking at the list and you're like, yeah, I'll reach for that one. That, that one's nice. <laughs> there it goes. You know. And then just go on to the next thing and then see what happens. But that way you can start off on that right foot. Right. Poisonous people. We you have chosen silly nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank that, we should add that to the talk. Yeah, we should, <laughs> that's yeah. a great strategy. <laughs> Uh, you had mentioned a project that, where they made decisions by consensus, and I don't know, did you mean they actually used consensus process, the formal process? And that sort of got me thinking of like, when you've got larger distributed open source teams where, it's, where you've got committers all over the world and you have to make those tough decisions, are there, have you seen good patterns of how to formalize, this is how we make those big decisions, and this is how we know we've, we've made our decision and we can move ahead? I think the question is how do you how do you actually do consensus based and what the mechanics of consensus based decision making, and I think it's uh, I think it's a matter of um, usually it's self apparent right it's pretty obvious when a consensus exists and when it doesn't, and if it isn't apparent, then I would argue that something is wrong or people aren't listening to each other, and and in, in the last resort you can you can get down to voting right, but that really is a last resort. Well, there's a, there's a sim one of the simple rules that we have is that. And, and many of our projects is that decisions make, take place in the mailing list. Okay. Very, very easy. People from going off on IRC, well, we're all awake and Europe is sleeping and we've made a decision and Europe's like, whoa, yo, what did you do? What happened? I don't well, know. We I decided to talk IRC about to this. Do I yeah, you know, yeah. they don't get to see in the background. So we'd have a lot of chats in IRC or when we worked in, together on Subversion in Chicago, we would have a lot of meetings sitting on the couches and then we would take our notes and our, sort of the ideas we come up with out of that, post them to the mailing list, and then decisions will be made there with everyone present. But that is fair, especially if you have a distributed team in lots of time zones. You make sure the only official discussion is discussion that happens on a mailing list. And, and we you also have to allow sufficient time for people to respond. Wait, and we also talk about lazy consensus. If you right. post an idea and someone says, that's a good idea, and three days later no one else has posted anything, then... Silence is a sin. Silence is a sin. <laughs> cool. 
Sure. Hey, um, uh, when people join my project, I want to make sure that, I mean, a lot of the problem with open source projects is that people don't really understand social interaction, and consequently they act like dicks. So <laughs> that's okay. We're here to help. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, is there is there um, an easily digestible version of this somewhere that I can point them to when they want to join the project? So just to make sure that they kind of understand what what we've all been talking about here. Well, this this t that actual yeah. talk, along with your question, will be posted to our website in the next week or so. But this talk is also what we give we give we gave this talk at Google and Mountain View last it's year or so. YouTube, right? It's up on YouTube now. So um, we're on the YouTubes. Oh, cool. And <laughs> and and there's also Carl's book is online. But but also it's just a matter. I mean, your own project, in addition to documenting, you know, coding policies and how to get involved and design and all that. You can also, if you really want to, you can you can document some kind of standard of conduct as well, right? And that helps too. Um, I've seen that in one or two projects. Yep. So. And we'll, we'll take one more question. Yep. We're going to call it quits for the day. Uh, more of a follow-up to the previous question about uh, consensus. Uh, I was briefly uh, involved in the uh, Adam Working Group, uh, which was hosted by the IETF, and. Uh, the, the IETF uh, has some good documents, actually, on uh, many of these issues. Uh, you know, their, their tagline is rough consensus and running code. Um, and in the Atom Working Group, we had a, a particular person who was appointed as the uh, chair of the working group, Timbre, uh, of, of Sun Microsystems. And he would periodically come, come along and sort of post a summary, as you had suggested, of you know a particular issue, and then say, okay, I think we you know we're we've achieved consensus here, or I'm not sensing consensus here, and people could argue with that at that point. Uh, say, no, we haven't really achieved consensus. I don't think so, you know, uh, or uh, you know, if no one posted any follow-ups to that, then it was just you know. So he was sort of the consensus manager. You talk about having a release manager and a patch manager. He was sort of you know the guy who came along you know every week or so and said yes we have consensus on this issue or no we don't. That's a great that technique. It worked oh. really well and wow. you know That's that was technique. that was a working group with a lot of people and a lot of strong opinions. I was one of them, um, and and it, it just it worked very well. It just kept the flow going of of the group. Uh, to have one person who, who would come along every now and then and say, yes, yeah. I see consensus but here. A lot, no. a lot of communities actually have external entities that have done that, Linux Weekly News, say, et cetera. And I would that. expect that person, maybe it might be even more effective if they weren't part of the discussion, if they were right. just basically like acting like a yeah. secretary. That was basically yeah. what, he, what he was. Right. He, he didn't yeah. uh, take part in many of the day-to-day -day discussions, but he would come along, sort of pop his head in and say, okay, I, I've been following this, and here's what I see, you know, the mood right. is shifting towards this or that. Anyway, it, and it worked very well. Anyway, uh, the IETF uh, has a number of uh, um, documents on uh, achieving consensus in an IETF way, which right. would be useful Great. reading. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So. We're, we're still going to be up here if you want to talk a little bit. That's all the Q&A we we'll take formally. There are feedback forms in your chairs for all the talks, not just our talk. We have heard feedback. We're always glad to hear what we can do to improve things. And, and, and we're right here. Thanks a lot right. for coming. Okay.